ridículas. Uh -huh. Russia's soil launch system is the result of more than 50 years of gradual evolution. It's the world's most reliable rocket, having flown more than 1,700 times, and commercial users love it. In the 1950s, when the USSR and the USA emerged as post-war superpowers, ballistic missile technology was pushed centre stage. Early results were frequently catastrophic. Because America could station missiles in Western Europe, they developed short-range weapons. But the Soviet Union had to develop the capability of delivering a heavy nuclear payload from Russia to the United States. The R-7 Semyorka was the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. It also gave the USSR the ability to launch a satellite into orbit a huge advantage in the early years of spaceflight. Americans were alarmed when their communist enemy began setting space records that were years beyond their free market technology. In 1958, President Eisenhower established NASA to consolidate America's space effort in one civilian agency, and the newly assembled team started work in a hurry the overwhelming feeling in the US was they were well behind the Russians. NASA absorbed the US Air Force's Man in Space Soonest program. It was renamed Project Mercury. Engineers began work on a titanium space capsule that could sustain a human in the vacuum of space and withstand the searing heat of re-entry. As prospective astronauts, 110 military test pilots met NASA's basic prerequisites and were invited to enter the rigorous selection process devised to choose the Project Mercury team. As well as being a qualified jet pilot with 1,500 flying hours, applicants had to have an engineering background and be younger than 40 at the time of selection. But some pilots were reluctant to volunteer feeling that astronauts would do little flying, simply serving as glamorised lab rats. When the first seven astronauts were introduced at a press conference, they were lauded as movie stars. It was 1959, and the only living thing to have orbited the Earth was a Russian dog. It was known that the Soviet Union was working to get a man into space, but NASA was determined that an American would get there first, so they began modifying the proven Redstone booster. Although it did not have the power to launch a man into orbit, they planned to make a series of short suborbital flights to test their technology. NASA's first manned orbital flights would use the SM-65 Atlas missile, a much larger ICBM that was being modified to carry the Mercury capsule. reliability was a problem. In September 1959, during the static test of an Atlas, a turbo pump failure triggered a complete shutdown. But fire persisted. The damaged pump was leaking oxygen. Damage to the pad took seven months to repair. Because so many boosters were blowing up, an emergency escape system was developed. A tower atop the capsule housed a small but powerful solid fuel rocket 
that could pull the spacecraft clear of a catastrophic failure. To test the escape system, a new booster known as Little Joe was built. It was based on existing technology and cheaper than using a full-scale rocket. The escape tower was tested on the ground at maximum dynamic stress and at very high altitude. A complex sequence of events had to happen automatically to return the capsule safely to an ocean splashdown. This would give problems at a later stage of testing. The capsule itself had to be tested and the new astronauts were each given an area of specialisation. Engineers would get direct input from the people who would fly the Mercury spacecraft. At NASA's Langley Research Centre, the new astronauts were schooled in concepts such as retrofire and re-entry. The Mercury 7 all had engineering degrees, and even at this stage, their feedback was leading to redesign of capsule control systems. Simulators were developed that gave an astronaut the sensation of a tumbling capsule, allowing the team to gain experience before they flew. On special flights, they had a taste of zero gravity. Towards the end of 1960, the Mercury team was nearing full-scale flight tests. The first Mercury-Redstone combination would make an unmanned suborbital flight to qualify the system. Alan Shepard had been selected to make the first manned flight, and it seemed he would be the first man in space. Known as MR1, this first Project Mercury vehicle was assembled at Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 5. It would test the automated flight control, the launch and tracking system, as well as recovery procedures. The capsule's automated abort system, a vital safety feature, would also be tested. It would be known as the four-inch flight. The booster engines abruptly stopped and the escape tower was jettisoned as programmed at the end of the boost phase. This triggered the deployment of the parachutes, leaving the capsule in place atop the fully fueled redstone. The problem had been caused when power plugs at the base of the redstone disengaged in the wrong sequence. A technician had filed down a contact to make it fit. A new booster was flown in to replace the damaged one. The same capsule would be used for the second attempt, but it had to be refurbished. The electrical connections that had triggered the engine shutdown were redesigned, and the automated sequencing for jettisoning the escape tower had been rethought. Main engine cutoff could only trigger the release of the tower 137 seconds after liftoff. The delayed flight, now known as MR1A, was launched on December the 19th. It flew higher than expected, but was otherwise flawless. Yet NASA had lost a month in their rush to put a man in space first. A chimp would make the next flight. Engineers were uncertain about risking an astronaut when the booster was still flying too high. Chimp number 65, known as Ham, would fly before a human, and the astronauts were not happy. The flight was designated MR2, and if it all went well, Alan Shepard would be next. But things did not go well. An overactive pump depleted the engine's liquid oxygen too quickly, and when the engine pressure dropped, the escape system kicked in, lifting Ham's capsule to an altitude of 253 kilometres, far higher than had been planned. Because the escape system had activated, the capsule's retro rockets had been jettisoned, 
meaning the spacecraft's ballistic return to Earth could not be slowed. Ham, the astrochimp, experienced more than 14 G during re-entry. Next, a valve opened early and the capsule lost pressure. Finally, when the capsule splashed down, 200 kilometers beyond the plan point, the impact bag was shredded and the heat shield had punched holes in the capsule base, flooding it with seawater. Ham had survived, protected inside the small compartment which functioned as his spacesuit, but debate about whether the system was ready to take an astronaut began. An extra flight to sort out the bugs in the Redstone booster was scheduled. At the same time, NASA was preparing the much larger Atlas booster in readiness for orbital flights. Developed as a weapons delivery missile, the Atlas was also being used to launch satellites. Its very thin stainless steel skin made it very light, but it was also fragile and its early safety record was not good. At its first launch, carrying a dummy Mercury capsule, the Atlas's thin skin buckled. It would be strengthened for all subsequent flights. It had not been publicly announced that Alan Shepard would make the first Mercury flight, but team members were growing in confidence that he would become the first man in space. But his flight was postponed several times. A replacement for the booster needed for the extra development test was slow in coming. An original launch in February 1961 was put off till March, then to May. In April, the Soviet team had yet another surprise. After a heartfelt farewell, Colonel Yuri Gagarin prepared to enter his Vostok spacecraft. The flight and Gagarin's identity had been a closely guarded secret, with none of his cosmonaut colleagues being aware who was to make the first attempt. The craft would function automatically, with Yuri Gagarin needing to enter a code to unlock the controls should it be necessary. Gagarin completed one full orbit of the Earth and returned safely. He was only in radio contact while flying over Russia. The first cosmonaut was a hero. The first manned spaceflight captured the world's attention and it surprised the Soviet Union as much as anyone. The smiling Gagarin became a huge asset to his country. The Soviet leaders wanted more, and government funding for space was assured. One group not happy about Gagarin's flight were the Mercury astronauts. While they were getting plenty of publicity, all they had done so far was train. Alan Shepard had missed the opportunity to be first and his short suborbital flight would be an anti-climax after the Soviet triumph. In the early hours of May the 5th, 1961, Shepard arrived at Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 5. A redstone launcher stood waiting, topped with the Mercury capsule Shepard had named Freedom 7. It was a pointed dig at the Soviet Union's political system. American media had branded Gagarin's flight as a propaganda stunt rather than a scientific achievement. Three, two, one, zero. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. After a delay, Freedom 7 blasted off. The flight climbed to a height of 187 kilometers. PSI, oxygen is go. What a beautiful view. 
At several points, Shepard took manual control of his craft, but it was over quickly, with the flight lasting just 15 minutes and 22 seconds. Freedom 7 splashed down in the Atlantic off the coast of Florida. Though Shepard had not orbited, Project Mercury had put a man in space, and America was keen to catch up. The idea that there was a race between the superpowers was becoming all too clear. Launched in June 2003, ESA's Mars Express reached Mars in less than seven months. It took advantage of the planet's closest pass by Earth in 60,000 years. It was the European Space Agency's first mission to the Red Planet, and it rose from the ashes of Russia's failed Mars 96 mission. Europe had made a major technical contribution to the Russian probe, but after a successful launch, the fourth stage failed to reignite, and Mars 96 burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. Though there is no outward similarity between the probes, Mars Express contains many of the same sensors and instrumentation as its Russian predecessor. Since its arrival at Mars, the probe has been imaging the Martian surface. Its instruments are designed to find out more about the planet's atmosphere and its geology, including evidence of surface water that may have existed in the past. Contour images of the surface reveal features that are familiar to us as having been caused by volcanic eruption, but all tectonic activity has ceased long ago. Mars shows signs of erosion too, yet the channels have long since dried. But the fact that water once flowed here may mean that rudimentary life got started. Just like Earth, Mars revolves on a tilted axis, giving it seasons, but because the planet's orbit is highly elliptical, there is broad variability in surface temperatures. In summer, it can reach 20 degrees Celsius, dropping to minus 90 overnight. Mars also has polar ice caps, but they're made of water ice covered in winter by a layer of frozen CO2. This layering process is not fully understood. Instruments on Mars Express suggest that the thin atmosphere is 95% CO2 with traces of nitrogen, oxygen and water vapour. It supports fine cloud and strong winds. Now, the only forces able to affect the surface topography are dust storms and meteor impacts. Mars Express is in an elliptical orbit around Mars at right angles to the orbit of Phobos, Mars' major moon. Recently, it made its closest approach to the tiny moon, which is too small to have a spherical shape. Phobos has the appearance of a captured asteroid, but scientists are puzzled by it. Its mass and density are lower than expected, so it's thought to be porous. Since it has been in orbit, the infrared spectrometer on Mars Express has continued to discover water, which has planetary researchers upgrading their expectations that some form of life may once have existed on Mars. Mars Express has had several mission extensions. New measures have been instituted to conserve the spacecraft's dwindling fuel reserves, and it looks like the mission will continue until its fuel finally runs out. Russia's iconic Soyuz launcher at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Currently, it's the only means of taking cosmonauts to the International Space Station. What makes it special is its direct lineage to the historic designs that launched the first satellite and the first man in space. 
The most striking outward similarity is the four strap-on boosters. Together these make up the first stage. The central core around which they cluster is known as the second stage, even though it ignites before launch along with the strap-ons. These stages are fueled by kerosene with a liquid oxygen oxidizer. After 118 seconds, the four first stage boosters are jettisoned and the second stage will continue burning for another three minutes. Like other Russian rockets, the Soyuz takes its name from one of its most frequently lifted payloads, the Soyuz spacecraft, which has been in service since 1967. Since the retirement of the US Space Shuttle, the Soyuz spacecraft has played an indispensable role in ferrying crews to and from the International Space Station. With a capacity of three cosmonauts, and with the ISS having a working team of six, there need to be two Soyuz spacecraft on hand at the space station in case an evacuation is required. The Soyuz launch system uses very simple production techniques. Unlike the American shuttle and the Saturn V's, the Soyuz is assembled horizontally, which saves a huge amount of extra manufacturing hardware and complexity. Final integration happens on a rail car and incorporates the lifting arm that will raise the rocket at the launch pad. The trip to the pad happens at a walking pace and it is a Russian tradition that cosmonauts due to fly will witness the rollout. At the pad, hydraulics are used to raise the Soyuz to vertical, where it is suspended above the flame pit and supported by four counterweighted arms. Fueling and service gantries also surround the rocket. The gantries will be withdrawn before launch, leaving the unique tulip-shaped configuration. This was originally devised to add extra support to the waiting rocket, as the Baikonur launch site is known for its strong winds. In 2011, a Soyuz launcher was being prepared for launch from a new site. It has been adapted for use at the European spaceport in French Guyana. With improved lift capacity and an enviable launch record, commercial satellite clients just love the Soyuz.